Did you know that your gut microbiome is now listed in the 12 hallmarks of aging? And poor gut health is getting more and more common in the West. And there's just so many diseases linked to an imbalance of bacteria in your gut. The top five are allergies and other autoimmune diseases, anxiety and depression, skin issues, weight gain, and cancer growth. Stay tuned to find out all the things I'm doing to improve my gut microbiome. Hi guys, Tony here. Today we're gonna to be reviewing my gut microbiome and working out ways to optimize it. There are like, uh, say, 12 hallmarks of aging. People argue, say, it used to be nine. Some people might even say more than 12. But let's just say 12 here. And the gut microbiome is one of them. And they all overlap. So it, things, if your gut was not in a good state of health, then other things aren't gonna be operating right either. The company I use for testing is Embiosis. I particularly like them. They haven't spent a lot of money on marketing, whereas the actual product itself has had a lot of development using AI to calculate food scores, the best foods to feed your gut microbiota. So this is an overview of my gut. And if you look, my gut age is 34, my chronological age is 37, hence it's saying rejuvenated. But if you look, my diversity is on the low end, just say below average, but not, not a great deal, but there's definitely room for improvement here. So this is looking at the uh, breakdown of all the different bacteria and how you compare to uh, the average. It breaks down all the different bacteria that you have in there and where you stack in that. So Protovella, that's a really important one, for example. And if you look here, I am actually way above the average here. So something is going right in my diet, but just not in all aspects. So that's where, you know, dialing in things, eating more of the foods that really feed it and eating less of the ones that aren't as good. And these are similar profiles with bacteria and none of them I particularly suffer with. I mean, I don't suffer with anything major health-wise, you know, apart from insomnia, that's probably my main weakness. Um, but migraines, I mean, that's the occasional uh, headache I get, but uh, that's more down to stress. I mean, I keep well hydrated. That's a good way of keeping it, uh, migraines at bay. If you think in relative terms, then attention disorders is the one I score highest at, me being 40% above the average. But this gap is something I've really closed up over the last couple of years. As I was diagnosed with ADHD back in the summer of 2021. These are my gut scores, so gluten sensitivity. So if you see here, I've got no sensitivity. Saying that though, if I was to eat a load of bread, then I would get reflux. So there's, I can handle wheat. Obviously I would go for bread that is not uh, ultra processed. You don't want it to have any extra additives or seed oils and things like that. But still, if you're just talking about whole wheat kind of bread, then uh, you know there's only so much people are tolerant to it but they can only everyone can only tolerate so much of something so that kind of grain so it doesn't mean just eat as much gluten as you can if you're not sensitive to it it just means you can handle more you just got to still have some caution about the quantity you have if you look here processed food index is the community average and so i'm actually below the avoiding processed foods so i do keep it to a minimum this is something i've been doing over the last couple of years this still work to be done but um, I'm definitely going in the right direction. So this is bowel motility, how many times you go to the toilet a day and I'm pretty much bang in the middle here so that's where you want to be. And having non-soluble fibre is really good for gut motility and that's something I do have a lot of. I mean you often you hear things like you need to cut down on carbs or people would cut down on sugar, cut down on, some people cut down on fat to a certain level, or people saying having too much protein ages your body, and then you start thinking, what, 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 what is there left? And fiber is definitely something you do wanna have a lot of, so that's, you know, it can be embodied with carbohydrates, yes, but foods that are high in fiber tend to not be very starchy. So if you look here, I'm low on antibiotic damage, which is good. So if you look here, autoimmune index, and I'm bang on the healthy individual, so that is optimized. So if you see here, uh, carbohydrate metabolism, and yeah, I'm actually above average for that. And then this is this tallies in with my genetics, where I'm well, I'm basically average in my genetics. But obviously, your gut microbiome is not exactly static like it is with your genetics. There is some room for play in there, depending how your life has been and things you've done over that period of your life. If you see here, I've got a metabolism just above average for weight gain. 
And this is one of the reasons I have a particularly strict diet. If you see here, my protein metabolism is actually below average, quite a bit in fact. So that means I do have to be careful not to overload with protein as what can happen is I do get bloated when I have meals out and I go for meaty things and I have a lot of it. I will get bloated. My, my digestion takes longer to digest that food. So I do have to be wary of that. If you look at my genetics, I have a poor response to sugar. Not very poor, but poor. And looking over many people's genetics, that is actually typical. Most people have a poor response to sugar. Some people can handle it, but some people really can't. So I'm somewhere in that middle ground. If you look at lactose sensitivity, I'm pretty much at no sensitivity. So I can have plenty of milk and cheese and whatever. I choose to keep it right to the bare minimum. And I do have the occasional whatever it is with lactose, but I, the reason why is because I'm just trying to keep animal protein down low to keep my inflammation low because of certain genes like the MTHFR gene, where I typically I have higher than average uh, inflammation in my body. I, have a, I carry two copies of the MTHFR gene. So if you look here, I'm a typical of someone with no vitamin deficiency. I'm pretty much at the top of the typical range. And uh, yeah, that tallies in with the amount of uh, supplements, vitamins and things I take, so yeah. So if you look here, my sleep quality is right at the top of the range. And that is something that is true. My actual quality of sleep is really high. I just don't get enough of it. But then that comes down to external factors like just even uh, the, the amount of cortisol in your body. So I tend to fall asleep, I have great sleep hygiene. I tend to fall asleep at a reasonable hour but I can wake up early. I've definitely got better at it, but it just depends on the pressure on me and just even sometimes just your enthusiasm for the day that so you could actually be your own worst enemy. So these are my nutrient scores here. So at the top of the range, I've got apples, pears, apricots, whole grain breads, acai berries, radishes. I never have them. I need to add radishes in really into my diet. Black grapes, and this is a good example. So black grapes where yeah, they do feed my gut microbiome, but then if you look at the flip side of it, I'm not the best at processing sugar. So in that instance, what would I do? Well, I keep, I do buy occasional grapes and I keep them in the freezer. And so you could just have a few of them. They last a long time. And for me, they actually taste better when they're frozen. They're almost like an ice lolly. So that's a great way of getting those prebiotics from food, but you're not overloading your body with sugar you can space it out gradually over time this is the same with occasionally i buy pomegranate juice and so i'm able to make it last a while rather than having a big glass of it where you've got a lot of fructose there i'm able to space it out it's, it seems to keep a bit longer than say orange juice i find but yeah say having 50 to 100 ml a day and you space that 700 ml bottle over that period of time it does seem to last for me so these these are all foods apart from that radish that i do eat and this is a good example, parsley, where recently I've been having a lot of parsley. I blend it into a smoothie with other things like celery, or I might have it with beetroot in a smoothie as well. I use a juice with a smoothie, cranberry, but a light one, so it's got no sugar. Yes, it does have some sweeteners, but I've overall I've cut the sweeteners right down. I might have some with my protein powder, and then I might use natural sweeteners now for like if I have bran or if I have porridge oats, I use like a stevia kind of based sweetener, which again is still not ideal because they use, it can be 50 or even more 70 processing chemicals to make that stevia. So it's, it's still better than having sugar or artificial sweetener, but it's still not ideal. And that's why just reducing that overall sweet tooth is the, the best way of avoiding those cravings for sugary things. And you might have heard of people going on about artificial sweeteners being bad for your gut microbiome, which is true. And so you wanna reduce that burden on your body. There are obviously there's worse things for it like antibiotics for sure. This is where just cutting down on sweeteners, sugars, and just lowering that sweet tooth to get rid of that uh, those cravings for it. And that's why be careful with the quantities of these sweetened things you have. Like I used to drink dark coke quite, quite frequently and now I've cut it right down. The occasional treat here and there. And then if you were to go with something even sweeter, I've had like a twister ice lolly. And when you go from a twister to a dark coke, you the coke actually doesn't taste that sweet so you can really desensitize yourself to sweet things if you have them too frequently these are pretty much all things i do have regularly silver berries no i don't have them black mulberries i need to incorporate that 
tangerine juice. I've never even seen it advertised. I mean, it can't be that dissimilar to orange juice. Purple sweet potato, that's not one I've had in a while, and I remember it actually tastes better than the orange variety. It's a bit more flavoursome, earthy, and it's actually got antioxidants in it that are really brain protective. If we filter down to the bottom of the list, so these are things that are not necessarily, they're not bad for your gut microbiome, they just don't particularly feed it. So these are things you could just have in smaller quantities because it's not as beneficial. And there might be other nutrients that you get from it which are really good for you. But then if you want to get multiple benefits from it, then think about your gut microbiome too. And that's why with parsley, I have a lot of it now. It has a polyphenol in it, uh, which is great for upregulating your NAD salvage pathway. And NAD is a really important coenzyme in your body. You need it. If you didn't have it, you'd be dead within 20 seconds, really optimizes with your energy. And that's why I have so much parsley. I could just buy the supplement Apigen, but I figured if I'm getting, if it's really feeding my gut microbiome at the same time, why not kill two birds with one stone? These are all my low things, but turmeric, obviously it's great for inflammation for my body because I've got the MTHFR gene I mentioned earlier, but it's not actually that anything special for my gut microbiome, same with spinach. If you're also looking to optimize your gut microbiome, then follow the link in the comments down below. I do sell the test individually at a price of 245 pounds, but I also offer it in a month free with my health span at subscription. This service is for customers looking to really optimize their health and longevity. And the reason Epic Genetics is so competitively priced is we don't pay to advertise. It's purely word of mouth and spreading awareness through social media content. Another great feature of Embiosis is you have supplement recommendations and so obviously it's looking at the different important bacteria and ones that you're a bit more deficient in. It'll make recommendations specific to that, you know, supplements that have the right bacteria for you. Thanks for watching. See you next time.